Well, it is uh, an honor to be invited to be here for this occasion and to be in this chapel and to be in this place which turned me upside down. And I'm grateful uh, beyond words. <clears throat> Sometime in the early 1980s, when I was a recent graduate of Union Presbyterian Seminary, I had a conversation with an uncle. It was in the context of a family funeral when we were all together. He has gone to glory now, but he, like my brother and my father and so many generations of ancestors before me, was a Presbyterian minister. We got to talking about the church and he told me of an occasion which happened at a general assembly when he was a commissioner from his presbytery in South Carolina. It was in 1968 at the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church U.S., which was held in Montreat. Those years were fraught with social issues like civil rights and Vietnam and the role of women in leadership. And even though such fraughtness is not unusual at Presbyterian General Assemblies, this particular assembly, said my uncle, fairly crackled at every moment with the tensions of the late 60s. My uncle shared with me a story of such tension that had happened there in the context, ironically, of prayer. Apparently, the, the docket for that meeting set aside space throughout the day for seasons of prayer, morning prayer, midday prayer, afternoon prayer, evening prayer. And in one of those prayer services on one of those days, the leader of the service offered a series of intercessions and before closing them, then called for petitions to be spoken from throughout the congregation of the assembly. Various concerns were lifted up and finally one voice offered this petition. Oh God, we thank you for many things, but especially for the great gift you have given us in Belhaven College, Reformed Theological Seminary, and the Presbyterian Journal. There was a moment of silence. <laughs> and then came another voice from out in the congregation. And, O oh God, we thank you for the great gift you've also given us in Davidson College, Union Theological Seminary in Virginia, and the Presbyterian Outlook. <laughs> Another moment of silence and someone cried out, Amen. <laughs> and then someone else cried out, No. <laughs> and then other voices cried out together, Amen. And other voices said, No. And there began this series of antiphonal chants of, Amen. No. Amen. No. Amen. No. And went on, went on for some while until the leader was able to finally get a hold of that service by summoning the Lord's Prayer as crowd control. <laughs> Had I been there, of course, I would have been a cheerleader on the side of Amen, and I know that my uncle would have been yelling equally loudly on the side of No. If that story is true, and I believe it is, then it looks like the Presbyterian Outlook missed a golden opportunity in 2018, the 50th anniversary of the cacophony of amens celebrating Davidson Union and the Presbyterian Outlook. <laughs> but here we are now at a far more important anniversary, the 200th anniversary of that wonderful magazine. And it is important on this occasion for us to reflect on the heroic role of this relentlessly independent church magazine as it is navigated and continues to navigate that still fraught space between amen and no. That after all is the purpose of an independent journal committed to the life of the church. There has been a place for sure for such house organs as in their time, Presbyterian Survey, Presbyterian Life, AD, in these days, Presbyterians Today, but the church's independent journals have shaped in sharper and more particular narrative the life of our communion precisely because of their voice and perspective and, well, independence. The very fact that the outlook is alive and well and thriving in this year of its bicentennial is a testimony to its successful history 
and its bright future as an independent magazine. In looking across its history, many of us will remember the cover pages of the May 31, 1993 issue of the magazine, its 175th anniversary issue 25 years ago. That front page looked to me like the diagram of the innards of a solid state transistor radio, which you could still buy, at least in secondhand stores, in 1993. It took the whole front page to do justice to the lines drawn from 20 or more predecessor journals witnessing to the lifetimes of multiple predecessor denominations and multiple regions of those denominations from as far back as 1819. The Presbyterian Church in the USA Old School, the Presbyterian Church in the USA New School, the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States of America, the United Presbyterian Church of North America, the Presbyterian Church in the United States, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, the United Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, and as of 1983, the reunited Presbyterian Church USA. All of these lines of journals representing these predecessor denominations feeding like tributaries into the larger river that in 1943 became the Presbyterian outlook based in Richmond, Virginia. My time in this address will not permit me to tromp around all of that landscape, so I will focus on what I call the modern era of the outlook starting in 1943. What movements and arguments and claims and changes have characterized those 76 years in the life of our church? And how did the outlook use its voice in the midst of them? I want to try to answer that question, at least partially. By focusing upon a handful of the great trends that have propelled us as a church from 1943 to this moment, and while I won't catalog the name of every single person of influence across those years, there are a few personalities who, because of their tenure and tenacity, require special attention because these are personalities who sometimes at great risk dared to navigate between amen and no. In the 1940s, when the Presbyterian Church U.S. was still deeply mired in its own provincialism, the Outlook's voice was blessed from its very beginning by the life and witness of the Reverend Dr. Ernest Trice Thompson, Sr. Perhaps the most influential claim upon our communion in those days was a theological relic within the Presbyterian Church, a heresy in my judgment, called the doctrine of the spirituality of the church. That in the wake of the Civil War and through the opening decades of the 20th century, interpenetrated the ethos of the Southern Church. That doctrine owes its life to Dr. James Henry Thornwell of Columbia Seminary, who articulated it in 1861 at the General Assembly of the new Schismatic Church, the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States of America. The express logic for this church's formation was that the Confederacy was a new nation, and the Presbyterian churches have always been national churches, and the PCCSA would also be a national church. Thornwell's spirituality of the church was supported by, among others, Dr. Robert Louis Dabney of Union Seminary and Dr. Charles Hodge at Princeton Seminary, all of whom taught and wrote across much of the 19th century, and coincidentally, two of whom were also slave owners. According to this doctrine, the church could only speak what was determined that Christ commissioned it to speak. It was exclusively a spiritual organization. It stressed that the church's mission was not to reform people or to correct the evils of society or to advance civilization, but rather to save sinners and to beseech them through Christ to be reconciled to God. In an era in our country in which wealthy planters had little regard for the human rights of enslaved peoples, even though as self-proclaimed Christians they were participating in the enslavement of other Christians, the spirituality of the church was a convenient doctrine for this new denomination. It both supported the institution of slavery and relieved pastors who might otherwise have been moved to speak prophetically against it from any burden, in fact, to do so. E.T. Thompson, in his own words, described the Southern Presbyterian Church at the close of the 19th century as solidly conservative, strongly Calvinistic, 
distinctly sectional and remarkably homogenous in outlook and belief. Nevertheless, in the early 20th century, the problems of war, industry, and race, aggravated by the Great Depression, created an opening for Thompson to challenge all of that, based on the thrust of John 3.16, for God so loved the world, and based also on John Calvin's claim that the world is the theater of God's glory, which urges us therefore to care about everything, not just our souls, but also our school systems, sewer systems, hospitals, public services, everything. E.T. Thompson preached and taught and wrote repeatedly in the Presbyterian Outlook in defense of the precepts of the emerging social gospel and in opposition to the doctrine of the spirituality of the church. As editor of the Outlook from 1943 to 1946 and as a co or contributing editor from 1946 to 1984, E.T. Thompson persistently encouraged the Southern Presbyterian Church to reclaim the reformed emphasis upon social responsibility. He was resisted for sure, surviving heresy trials at the Presbytery, Synod, and General Assembly level, but he was nonetheless vindicated by the church courts, and from start to finish, he embodied both progressive orthodoxy and public theology. Here is how my dear friend Dean Thompson, an American church historian, a parish pastor, and former president of Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, has described E.T. Thompson's impact via the outlook upon the church. As co-editor, president, and contributing editor, he diligently sought to teach American Presbyterians the meaning of Christian grace as both truth and power as it penetrates and breaks down racial hostilities. <clears throat> Another setting in which Amen battled regularly with No was that of the biblical theology across much of at least the first third to half of the, general, of the 20th century. Over the last decade of the 19th century and the earlier decades of the 20th century, the fundamentalist modernist controversy raged throughout the Protestant mainline in the North, and particularly in the Presbyterian Church USA, the so-called Northern Presbyterian Church. In the North, the Westminster Confession was revised, dropping language declaring that the Pope was the Antichrist, and adding a declaratory statement that included these lines, concerning those who are saved in Christ, the doctrine of God's eternal decrees is held in harmony with the doctrine of God's love to all mankind. That concerning those who perish, the doctrine of God's eternal decree is held in harmony with the doctrine that God desires not the death of any sinner, but is provided in Christ a salvation sufficient for all, freely offered in the gospel to all, and that men are fully responsible for their treatment of God's gracious offer. As Bo Weston points out in his illuminating history, Presbyterian pluralism, it was this revision of the Westminster Confession that made it possible in the early 20th century, after almost a century, for the reunion of the Presbyterian Church USA, the so-called Northern Presbyterian Church, and the greatest measure of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. This was essentially a reunion that pleased and motivated the modernist wing of the Presbyterian Church USA in great measure, I suspect, because of the prevailing Arminianism in the Cumberland Church. The next great victory was the creation of the Federal Council of Churches in 1908, kind of the precursor to the National Council of Churches. The inclusivists in the Northern Church had earlier desired a union with the Episcopalians, but when that didn't happen, they began to work, writes Weston, on a project of federal union which would not interfere with the sovereignty of any member church, but would allow for a united Protestant voice and more efficient Protestant action. Decisions such as these were producing in the North a new church. Over time, modernists were countered by fundamentalists and there were a number of skirmishes, Harry Emerson Fosdick being removed from First Presbyterian Church in New York, Gresham Machem versus Henry Van Dyke, and then ultimately Princeton Seminary, and on and on. But across these early decades of the 20th century, the modernists were scoring their victories. And by comparison, the Southern Church, 
by now the Presbyterian Church in the United States, was like a bucolic pond, or perhaps even a stagnant pond, <laughs> of relative theological and political uniformity and harmony. It would be hard to overstate its parochialism in the early 20th century. Lewis Sherrill wrote in the Union Seminary Review in 1931 an article entitled The Barrenness of the Presbyterian Pen, meaning the Southern Presbyterian Pen. He stated that nothing of any consequence was being produced amongst the scholars and pastors of the South. According to Aubrey Brown in an address he gave in 1989 to a meeting of the Fellowship for St. James, E.T. Thompson agreed with this sentiment and said, no book had appeared before 1861 or after, up to this time, 1931, which had been recognized beyond the denomination as a distinct contribution to theological literature. Brown went on to say, both men, Sherrill and Thompson, listed reasons for this, but neither mentioned, said Brown, what I believe was the underlying one, intimidation, if not fear, that their careers would be destroyed. Brown went on. Let us imagine a starry-eyed student finishing the seminary in one of those years, like say 1932, with a concern for the church's ecumenical heritage, a deep desire to see a reunited Presbyterian family, some awareness of the social implications of the gospel, and a hope that the abiding truths of our faith might be expressed in a language with meaning and power for our own day. What kind of venue did that student face? The General Assembly of 1931 had pulled the church apart from our brothers and sisters in the other major denominations who worked together in the Federal Council of Churches, and the Christian Century commented on the withdrawal by saying, in effect, good riddance, they were always dragging their feet and causing trouble for us anyway. <laughs> Brown went on in his address to describe the Southern Church in those years as a theological wasteland. Nonetheless, E.T. Thompson, in his monumental three-volume history, Presbyterians in the South, noted with maybe his tongue in his cheek that the Southern Church in these years had complete confidence in its theological seminaries. The Presbyterian of the South, the immediate predecessor to the Presbyterian outlook, rejoiced in there being no sign of heresy and no laziness in teaching. We send our young men to these schools of the prophets without fear of damage, it declared. <laughs> in these early decades of the 20th century, faculty in those schools, this school, Union Seminary in Virginia, Columbia Theological Seminary, Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, shared a common commitment to the doctrine of verbal plenary inspiration and to an almost uniform rejection of historical criticism. The five fundamentals, the inerrancy of scripture, the virgin birth of Christ, Christ's vicarious atonement, his bodily resurrection, and his miracles were accepted without question. Moreover, the so-called destructive higher criticism was predicted by numerous Southern Presbyterian biblical scholars to be on its way out, and Dr. Thompson cites in his history that Dr. John M. Wells a president of Columbia Theological Seminary, in defining modernism, stated that it included pantheism, higher criticism which rejected the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, Unitarianism which denied the deity of Christ, evolutionism, and Bolshevism. <laughs> There was one seminary faculty member in a Southern Presbyterian seminary in the early decades of the 20th century who explained in this way why he believed to the bottom of his heart in the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. Moses could have, writ Moses could have written it, he said, and if Moses could have written it, Moses would have written it. <laughs> Moses should have written it, and therefore Moses wrote it. 
This anecdote has been shared with me a number of times by a number of long retired faculty from Austin Seminary who swear that the professor who said that was Dr. Robert F. Gribble, professor of Old Testament and exegesis in the first decades of the 20th century uh, at Austin Seminary. However, I must also say, and I find this interesting, that other scholars, when I've shared this anecdote, have speculated that this comment could have been said by this or that professor at Columbia, Union, or Princeton seminaries. On top of that comment, though, one of Dr. Gribble's successors, Dr. James Wharton, is on record for having heard Dr. Gribble once say that the doctrine of the spirituality of the church was the bride of fundamentalism and he meant that as a compliment. <clears throat> Such was the character of our church in the early decades, maybe even the first third, in some places the first half of the 20th century. Again, in Dr. E.T.'s words, solidly conservative, strongly Calvinistic, distinctly sectional, and remarkably homogenous in outlook and belief. Modest as it may sound, and from its beginnings, the Presbyterian outlook began publishing as a courageous counterpoint to this environment and in great measure because of Dr. E.T. Thompson, the Uniform Bible Studies. These regular columns were written for the benefit of lay people who often based their Sunday school curriculum and presentations upon them. They were reverent examples of biblical and theological criticism in which they explored the texts in terms of their contexts and in light of current events. In what was otherwise and overwhelmingly a hermetically sealed ecclesial and theological environment, here was a place in the pages of the outlook in which it was regularly demonstrated for the sake of curious lay people that the Bible is a more interesting and engaging thing than simply a book which dropped in its pristine completeness out of heaven. People could read the outlook and encounter a faith shaped by the word of God and by human vessels, a book that we did not simply read, but that read us. As Dean Thompson has put it, these uniform lessons were a progressive and evangelical teaching bridge, linking the outlook and the church's mind and duty to a contemporary spirit and leading Presbyterians to participate in mission and to think and study through the help of Christian ethics, both personal and social, the modern biblical insights and the ecumenical commitments. Now, of course, there were reactions and cancel subscriptions and heresy charges and bad press. But the outlook, and certainly Dr. E.T., both prevailed. In fact, that gentle, shy, soft-spoken man who nonetheless nurtured a prophet's heart was awfully good at prevailing, maybe even to the point sometimes of being a little sneaky. <laughs> In a conversation I had with his grandson, the Reverend Ernest Trice Thompson III, Ernie told me that, quote, when granddad came to the seminary in 1922, he began his time there teaching the English Bible but they were concerned about his fascination with higher criticism, and so they moved him to teaching church history, and his first course in church history was the Book of Acts. <laughs> Robert Bullock recounted to me words spoken to him several decades ago by Bill Jablonowski, longtime iconic pastor of St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church in Fort Worth, and a card-holding member of a group of progressive pastors in the 50s and 60s and 70s known as the Texas Mafia, Bill Jab would go to every PCUS General Assembly and he and others would strategize throughout each assembly, generally at the feet of Dr. E.T. And he told Robert Bullock once, it's like sitting at the feet of the Buddha. <laughs> Even in the tightly bound environment of the Presbyterian Church U.S. in the early years of the 20th century, the outlook beginning under Dr. E.T. Thompson and prevailing in every other era unto this day modeled a preoccupation with wider horizons, 
Its pages regularly witness to the activities of the greater church, the Church Universal, Church with a capital C. At the very least, this meant that prior to the reunion in 1983, the Outlook reported regularly to the Southern Church what was going on in the Northern Church. And this diligence in lifting the curtain between the two communions and keeping it lifted was a great impetus to their eventual reunion. Starting in the remarkable 35-year tenure of Aubrey Brown's editorship, contributing editors came not just from the South, but from everywhere. The Outlook also extensively covered the goings-on of the National Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches, various glimpses of parish life in the Church of Scotland and in England, as well as in missionary outposts throughout the Global South. Why was such exhaustive coverage important? Maybe Aubrey Brown put it best in an address he gave at Second Presbyterian Church in Richmond in 1995 when he was reflecting upon his editorship of the Outlook across 35 years, 31 of them under the roof of that great church. In his remarks, Brown dwelt upon the name of one of the Outlook's predecessors, the Watchman of the South. Drawing on the Old Testament roots of the word Watchman, Brown noted that if the watchman was not alert and did not sound the warning and the city fell, he was held accountable. Brown went on to note that Outlook has something of the watchman idea in it and it was needed. The church's bureaucracy was committed to keeping the lid on things and the curtains drawn. It would tell the church what it wanted it to know. Boards and committees were closed to the church press and you might be given selected information or none at all. It was a long and constant struggle to get them opened up as they are today, he said, though there are some agencies, bureaucrats, and institutions that try to keep the doors closed and let the church know only after crucial actions are taken. This, he said, is why we have the continuing need for a bold and insistent and independent church magazine to turn the spotlight on what is being planned or is happening in the church and let everyone know if that magazine does not use its independence to fulfill that role, it has no reason for its being and does not deserve our support. Those were prophetic words from a man who embodied a great prophetic spirit. No prophet is perfect, of course, and the lament that on his watch the outlook could have done more to robustly offer a moral and theological critique of the Vietnam War has been well documented. Some have suggested that Professor John Leith here at Union lobbied the outlook against such critique. And my guess is that where, whether or not that is true, we may never know the complicated and perhaps intensely personal dynamics at work in treading softly around that story. Nonetheless, Aubrey Brown should be credited with shaping the voice of the outlook in a bold and ongoing direction. He and E.T. Thompson, across the span of their witness, created, as Ben Sparks has said, a response to the spirituality of the church in almost every respect. Race, ordination of women, church history, church unity, ecumenism, civil rights. Work in areas evolved, Sparks continued, out of the swamp and quicksand of Southern Presbyterian, Pres Presbyterianism. It is not an accident, by the way, that when Aubrey Brown retired from the outlook after 35 years and after countless steps taken toward beholding and representing the church with a capital C, the outlook chose as its next editor, the Reverend George Laird Hunt, a pastor from the United Presbyterian Church in the USA with which the Presbyterian Church US had not yet reunited. A few decades earlier, such a selection would have been unthinkable. What created the possibility of Hunt's selection, though, was a desire cultivate, cultivated by Brown and Thompson and many others to bring to the ecclesial sphere the news and joys and struggles of Christians all over the world and all over the country. In those days, the outlook infused its readers, as Ben Sparks has put it, with news of the church universal, but never at the expense of an equal preoccupation with the church with a small c. Unapologetically, the outlook fostered a deep relationship with parish life, its leadership, its Christian education programs, its ministries to youth and children, its music, its relationships to larger communities, and the outlook's connection with Second Church in Richmond, which hosted the outlook's offices for years and still does, 
and whose pastors became ongoing conversations with its editors is just one example. Every year, beginning with the days of Aubrey Brown's editorship and every other year now, the May meeting of the Fellowship of St. James, a Richmond-based collegium of pastors and scholars meeting monthly, is devoted to the agenda of the upcoming General Assembly. It is a time when the editor briefs this group of clergy and there is rich dialogue. Outlook editors have been busy calendars, have had busy calendars made more busy by their preaching and teaching throughout the church, perhaps none of them more so than the Outlook's current editor, Jill Duffield. And while the Outlook has increasingly developed a national stature which sets it apart and deservedly, many across the years who've known it well as practically members of its family can still be found to recall those legendary stories of, for example, how in their adolescent years, each of Aubrey Brown's eight children worked at the Outlook after school and on Saturdays, stuffing envelopes, helping with mailings, and doing whatever was necessary to keep it alive. George Laird Hunt, Aubrey Brown's successor, served from 1979 to 1988, remarkable period of institutional construction in the life of the church, and witnessed such events as denominational restructuring, the uh, adoption of a brief statement of faith, the reunion of the two largest Presbyterian churches in the country, the last of America's denominations separated by the Civil War to finally reunite, all of these things on Hunt's watch. Hunt's years also witnessed women continuing to knock persistently on doors, mostly still shut but nonetheless beginning to open, and the rising voices of the LGBTQ communities demanding their place too at the table of welcome. Reflecting on all of this, Hunt beheld our reunited church and observed a lack of trust yet in each other, in our leaders, in our processes, in our governing bodies, and in our agencies. It may even be a lack of trust in God, Hunt wrote in the Outlook, a despair that God can do anything to bring order to this fractured church. This lack of trust, he continued, grows out of our failure to know and respect and learn one another despite our differences. In this, we mirror our societies rather than set an example for reconciliation. We're like the kingdoms of this world rather than a sign of the reign of God. One afternoon in Allen, Texas, a suburb of Dallas, the founding pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Allen was mowing his lawn there was a phone call from Hunt soliciting this pastor's interest in interviewing for the Outlook. This man's father had been a devoted student of E.T. Thompson at this seminary union, and he himself had been a student at e. of E.T. Thompson, among others, at Austin Seminary before going to Princeton University to earn a Ph.D. in American church history. Robert Bullock remembered with fondness E.T. Thompson's work at the Outlook, and he took the interview because, he said, I do believe in the providence of God and the call of God. Part of that call for Bullock had to do with holding the church together. If Aubrey was trying to get us together, he said, I was trying to keep us together. On Bullock's watch, the outlook's financial picture improved dramatically. When Robert went to Richmond in 1988, the magazine had $50,000 in reserves. And when he left in 2003, the outlook had $1.3 million in reserves. He also worked hard with respect to representation at all levels of decision-making bodies in the church so that meaningful and not just token theological diversity could be honored. The person who sits in the editor's chair, he said, is totally independent, not tied to anything. Having a huge amount of freedom, that person therefore needs also to have humility. Robert Bullock, who arrived at the Outlook as a Southern progressive, was succeeded by the second editor from the old Northern Church, Jack Haberer, who arrived at the Outlook as a Northern Evangelical. At his first Outlook meeting, Outlook board meeting, someone took assessment of the changes in the world and the changes in the way people wrestle with ideas and said to Jack, now we're in a new world that is flat, a total democracy of ideas. Then that person paused and said, Jack, you've got to reinvent this. On his watch, the outlook became more and more a convener of the conversation rather than the only voice in the conversation. Moreover, he seized the opportunity to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the PCUA's first ordained woman deacon, 
the 75th anniversary of its first woman elder, and the 50th anniversary of its first woman pastor. In short order came the Outlook's celebration of the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, which itself was near the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. One day early in Jack Haber's tenure, Dr. Dick Ray, a member of the Outlook board then, expressed to Jack with a respect to social issues, a sentiment embraced by Robert Bullock in his tenure. Dick said, Jack, the greatest social justice issue now is how the left and the right can stay together in one church. And Jack, he said, we believe you are specifically equipped to reach out in that direction. Haber was indeed instrumental during his editorship in modeling that theological generosity and in slowing the pace and limiting the number of churches toying with schismatic departures. He openly advocated for the unity of the body and for living together with our differences. I asked him about his fondest achievement as editor, and Jack said, I never stopped calling myself an evangelical. It was my desire to dignify the heart of evangelicalism at its best so that the left and the right could show each other what each other looks like on their best days. Also, he said, we outlasted Newsweek. <clears throat> <laughs> The truth of the matter is that the Outlook has also outlasted every other independent journal and every other Protestant denomination in the country. What an accomplishment for us to note on this, its 200th anniversary. As I have traced ever so briefly the succession of editors in the modern era of the Outlook and the way it responded to the world and the church across these particular decades, it is remarkable to me that at the conclusion of every editorship, the next editor didn't just pick up where the other left off as if they were all clones of each other. No, the next editor, one after another after another, brought an astonishing sense of uniqueness and fit appropriate to chapter after chapter of an ever-changing context. As I have been preparing for this presentation, it has sunk into my soul as a child in the Southern Church that over and over again, beneath so much of who we've been as a communion, even in the modern period of the outlook, there has lurked the matter of racism. And way back into the 1940s, the outlook struggled with what Tom Curry has called a concept of a Southern Zion. There was a smug sense of satisfaction, even then and in some places even now, that was part of our church from its very beginning. We were not so much a missional body as we were an ethos of racist and classist complacency, wrapped in a closed loop language of piety. That lurking matter of racism and all of its unfinished business has prevented the Southern Church from expressing its full and joyful missional self. You can dip into any decade and find it, but it was certainly conspicuous in the 60s. Many young ministers graduating from seminary then were going into the parish at a time when there were tremendous pressures upon them to conform to the incipient racism that was practically everywhere. In historian Erskine Clark's brand new history of Columbia Theological Seminary, Clark observes that everywhere congregations were insisting that pastors continue to support openly or by their silence and inaction the oppressive practices and racist assumptions of a segregated South. Of course, some former students at Columbia and almost anywhere else were already convinced segregationists and did not need such pressure to reinforce their commitments to racism. They argued in print and church meetings and papers that the Bible and Orthodox theology supported a segregated South. One Columbia graduate, Morton H. Smith, would go to teach at Belhaven College and later at Reformed Theological Seminary and would eventually become the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in America, which would be established in 1973 in Jackson, Mississippi. While Smith was at Belhaven College, writes Clark, he argued that the civil rights movement would destroy divinely established human diversity and help to establish communist domination over America. When he went to Reform just a few years later, 
He insisted that the Bible did not condemn segregation. The fact is, he wrote that God segregated Israel from the Canaanites, and he said that the church should not try to change that particular pattern by branding one form of culture as sinful as opposed to another. The Presbyterian Journal, Clark continues, was a primary venue for the promotion of racist ideology in the church. There were, of course, heroic stories of PCUS pastors, but in those days they were relatively unusual. Erskine Clark wrote, most white Presbyterian ministers throughout the South remain discreetly silent in the face of the violence and racism that marked the long history of the American South, or they quietly gave up and left the ministry, or they quoted Bible texts in an attempt to prove that segregation was the will of God. Clark says that one of the great high water marks in the Presbyterian Church U.S. regarding race in that crucial decade happened in 1966 when Martin Luther King Jr. was invited to speak at a conference in Montreat. King was by then a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, but as Clark puts it, there was fierce opposition in the church to his participation. Some said King was a communist, others said he did not believe in the fundamentals of the faith, still others insisted the church had no business addressing social issues. Nonetheless, opposition or not, Dr. King came and Dr. King spoke. I was there. My parents took me to hear Dr. King. I must admit that as a middle schooler, I was more interested in the drama around that event than I was in the deep content of his address, although I was deeply impressed by his cascading rhetoric and by the spirit of his message. The Montreat Auditorium was packed. The security was tight. Dr. King arrived in a long procession of Buncombe County, North Carolina sheriff's cars, all lit up and I watched from outside one of the auditorium's doors as he was spirited from one car to a room off stage where the efficients for the evening were waiting. I also remember a later moment after the event was over when my parents and I, back in our car, were inching out of the parking lot. I was sitting by myself in the back seat in the middle and someone walking to the car recognized my father behind the wheel and so he said as dad rolled down the window, Hello, Hubert. What did you think about that? And Dad responded, I thought it was a great message. They talked for a moment, and then the window went back up, and we continued to inch out of the parking lot. And my mother turned to my dad and said, What do you mean, great message? That wasn't a great message at all. He was saying that all this trouble in this country was our fault, and it's not. I realized in that moment that I was sitting in the middle of that back seat between two poles of a national argument that loomed over everything. And that event did not end conflict in the church over race or over king. As Erskine Clark writes, it rather intensified the conflict as conservatives began to organize for a division of the church. Five years later, leaders working for the formation of what would come to be the Presbyterian Church of America were to denounce, were to denounce King for his communist connections his advocacy of violence, murder, and lying as a means to a millennial end, and his public rejection of such fundamentals of the faith as the virgin birth and Christ's physical resurrection. Part of the Southern Church's racist and classist complacency is still marked, I think, by stains from the spirituality of the church. And those stains have often been expressed in some ultimately futile desire for balance in all things. Montreat, by the way, is a tidal basin of virtually every political and theological conviction that you can imagine. It's hard to believe that that many largely white, largely privileged Southern Presbyterians can have that many opinions. <laughs> And so naturally, the specter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. coming to Montreat made a number of people angry because whatever else he represented, he didn't represent balance. And so, as Jill told me recently, the suggestion came from some quarter that yes, we should invite Dr. King to speak, but in the interests of balance, we should also find another occasion and invite a white segregationist to speak. Yet another manifest manifestation of amen versus no. Thank God that didn't happen. But friends, one of the sins of our church that we need to confess is the sin of worshiping balance more than the radical gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Balance has been too often an article of faith, but it is not faithful. At a board meeting early in my tenure at Austin Seminary, we were talking about future changes we might make in our curriculum, and one of our faculty members was present. He was a classical evangelical. And a board member concerned about the possibility that we might steer our curriculum in a direction that was too liberal said above, else, above all else, our curriculum and our teaching should demonstrate balance. And that faculty member summoned the courage to say to that board member, with all due respect, the gospel is not about balance. In that particular issue, that faculty member was probably speaking against his own theological self-interest but I was so deeply grateful for that remark. From the no side of this issue, he was witnessing to my amen side. From his side of the aisle, he called out my own tribalism, my own complicity in nuancing gospel values. The gospel is about more than balance. To put it more strongly, it's not about balance at all. And I believe that in these days, we are busy creating the history of our reunited Presbyterian Church USA and some portion of which was born out of the heresies of the Confederacy. And we are being called to venture beyond the safety of balance. We're being called to strive to be more faithful, thank God, than the church we grew up in. We're being called in this time and culture so defined by deep divisions and shocking irresponsibility on the part of national and global leaders who know better to raise our gospel voices and to venture beyond the supposed safety of balance. Hard challenges for the outlook. And yet look at it. It is such a beautiful, comprehensive, provocative, stimulating magazine. And speaking for myself, I have never been more excited about it than I am now. I especially celebrate the fact that at the helm there is a woman. The first woman in the outlook's history to have the power and the editorial voice not to mention the other necessary gifts and then some to do this work and to continue the process of opening up the outlook to newer and wider voices and perspectives. Nonetheless, the cultural backdrop against which and to which the outlook speaks is all so much meaner. This backdrop is being shaped by a particularly dangerous political climate in this country by shootings like the one at Mother Emanuel Church in, Aust in Charleston and so many others by the terror created by neo-Nazis storming the city of Charlottesville. And as that amazing editor of the Outlook said to me recently, all of this has lifted a veil for me that was never a veil for friends of color. She's right. People of color know and the rest of us need to work hard to know also that the gospel is about more than balance and that sometimes it is impossible to say there are good people on all sides. I recently read a sermon with which I close. Not the whole sermon, by the way. Amen. I recently read a sermon in which the preacher was articulating the problem with balance. It is easy to be in the middle, said the preacher, when the boot is not on our neck. The policies aren't truncating our futures, and the prejudices aren't rendering our children dead in the streets. But thanks be to God, the preacher went on, that we've been given a better way. We are no longer enslaved to the flesh-devouring ways of the world because Christ has set us free, free from sin, free from death, free from fear, free from the tyranny of self, and the reign of any ruler but God. Christ has set us free for freedom's sake. We are free to take a stand, to stand for love of neighbor, for generosity of life-giving justice, for the peace that passes understanding and the joy that comes in serving God and God only. We are freed for a kindness that upends cruelty and reveals the divine dignity and worth of every human being we are freed for self-control that looks to the interest of others and refrains from vengeance even as it seeks to be patient, forgiving, compassionate, and merciful with all people. We are freed for gentleness with the weak and with one another 
We are freed for faithfulness in a world overflowing with evil and idols, suffering and sorrow. Freed to call out the purple of privilege. And by privilege, I think the preacher means refusing to take a stand for the gospel. The preacher goes on, free to be immersed in the purple of penitence that not only confesses but repents and does better. Freed to be awash in the purple of preparation that not only welcomes the baby Jesus but reminds us to be ready to face Christ when he returns to separate the sheep and the goats. That was an excerpt from a sermon that Jill Duffield esteemed editor of the Presbyterian Outlook preached back in June at First Presbyterian Church in Charlottesville for a meeting of the Presbytery of the James. She was confessional, empathic, fierce, faithful, and in the holiest way possible, unbalanced. Like her predecessors, she is uncommonly suited for this time, this place, this church, this magazine. She is leading us, thanks be to God, to take new risks, to exercise old demons, to encourage new voices, and to step out as church into the midst of the world in the name of the one who gave his life for that world and for us. So may God bless you and this magazine as we move now to our third century of witness. Thank you.